So for everyone watching, the subject that we're going to be talking about today is very close to my heart. I have a personal experience with PCOS and it is a very common disorder that many women are finding themselves struggling with. One thing I want to keep um, everyone to keep in mind, our bodies are complex ecosystems. And just one is that because I am work just because um, I'm working with a body positive gym does not mean that uh, I have arrived, uh, that I can confidently shout from the rooftops every day how much I love myself, that everything is blissful, and that I'm at complete peace with my body. Self-love, self-acceptance is a journey that we will be on for the rest of our lives. And we have to make the choice frequently to do the hard thing, which is to go against the grain from societal programming and say, Maybe different, I may not fit the mold and standards, but I choose to honor my authentic, unique self and enjoy my life regardless. Some days there will be wins and some days there will not be, but that's okay. Um, and lastly, y'all, uh, I'm going to do, include a disclaimer. I am not a medical professional. Everything I am going to be sharing is based on research, but my personal story is my own. And if you suspect you might have similar health concerns, I would recommend seeking the advice of a professional before making any major decisions. So here we've just got our, um, our agenda. You can look through that quickly. Maybe touching on my life story, um, some of the science behind PCOS, how it ties into mental health and what we're trying to do here at Clarity. Um, and then also, um, touching on how to support the movement of um, advocacy. So this is a oops, very complicated disorder. Um, and in order for y'all to get a better understanding, we're going to start off this webinar by taking a look at what PCOS is and what the symptoms and complications are, and then a little bit of pathology. So not too much science, but enough for y'all to get um, some good understanding. Polycystic ovary syndrome is a women's health problem caused by an imbalance of reproductive hormones. In the past, the focus of PCOS has been on the menstrual cycle and women's fertility. However, it's a complex disorder, including metabolic, hormone, and reproductive organ, syndrome, organ systems. Um, signs and symptoms are usually gonna become apparent like in the late teens or early 20s. And then, Symptoms. Symptoms can include anything from, um, you know, things that we're going to see more commonly, which is the irregular periods or none at all, difficulty getting pregnant, um, excessive hair growth known as hirsutism, um, thinning of the hair on the head, like uh, called alopecia, um, a lot of acne, some low sex drive, um, bowel problems, mood changes, and, and all of that. It's quite, a, it's quite a long laundry list of symptoms. And then we've got complications, which can include cancer of the uterine lining, otherwise known as endometrial cancer. There's a three times higher risk. Um, and then heart disease and stroke, the risk of heart attack is four to seven times higher. Um, infertility will be seen in 78% of cases um, with some having miscarriage or premature birth. We have a um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which can be pretty dangerous and really high rates of diabetes that are seen before the age of 40, as well as some of those mood disorders I mentioned with the depression and anxiety. And that laundry list of symptoms can make it uh, sound pretty dire. And although treatment is very important, the outlook of recovery in many areas is totally possible. So the exact cause of PCOS isn't known. However, the determined factors that do play a role are uh, research suggests that there are certain genes linked to PCOS and that it does run in families. For example, um, I think a woman has a 50% uh, higher chance of getting PCOS if a mother or sibling has it. Um, and then male siblings are also more likely to so uh, show signs of insulin resistance if they have PCOS in the family. And then we've got the excess androgen, um, which just androgens are male hormones. Um, the most common one that y'all would have heard of is testosterone. So the ovaries can produce abnormally le uh, high levels of these androgens. 
And that's what's going to result in a lot of those symptoms and the, um, the difficulty with ovulation primarily. And then on to the next one, uh, just to touch briefly, excess uh, estrogen and decreased progesterone. Those are both hormones that are secreted by the ovaries as well, and they're vital for normal function. Um, in PCOS, the body is able to produce estrogen, but not enough, to, um, not enough progesterone. And progesterone is so important because it's what prevents uterine contractions that could dislodge or disturb a growing embryo. And the low progesterone is why miscarriages are common with PCOS. Additionally, um, without progesterone, estrogen is kind of running without having that um, the other side to sort of um, equal and balance things out. So estrogen becomes a, do a dominant hormone. And um, the issue with that primarily is the endometrial cancer um, risks go up, but also other symptoms like uh, PMS, um, bloating, and then blood clots as well. Then we've got insulin resistance and excess insulin. Um, most people know insulin is the hormone that is produced by the pancreas and just allows muscle cells to use sugar for energy. Um, insulin is basically what pushes sugar into the cells so that they can be used for energy. Um, and when your cells are already full of sugar and fat, there isn't room for more sugar. And so basically insulin is released um, more, more insulin is released to try to push like harder with more manpower to get the sugar in the cell, but it doesn't work. So you've got these elevated levels of insulin and sugar. And so your body's like, oh, okay, well, let's turn all this sugar into triglycerides and cholesterol and go store it in the liver. <laughs> And that's how you get the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which can be pretty dangerous. Um, and over time, the cycle is going to continue and your cells end up becoming um, more resistant to insulin. And that's when sugar can't even get into the cell for energy. You're going to be feeling very fatigued. Um, most pre um, people with prediabetes, you know, they suffer with issues of fatigue and craving um, quick sources of energy, like more sugar, um, that further perpetuates the cycle. Um, additionally, excess insulin can cause other issues um, with the hormones that regulate hunger and fullness. Um, and also, they do increase androgen production even more. So that's a really important piece, I would say, the insulin resistance and the excess androgens. Um, but then we also have this chronic low-grade inf inflammation. And that can be caused by anything from um, stress, lack of good sleep, uh, some undiagnosed food in, uh, sensitivities, gut microbiome issues, um, et cetera. And research has shown that women with PCOS do have a type of chronic inflammation that stimulates the ovaries to produce even more androgens. So you can see we have all of these, um, these avenues to which we're getting the problem, the underlying problem of um, excess androgen. Um, so anyways, now that we have a little bit better of an understanding of what PCOS is, uh, I do want to help you guys look at what PCOS is not by just deconstructing three very common myths. The first one is that PCOS is a rare condition. This is not true. It's estimated about 10% of women have PCOS. That's 11.5 million women, y'all. It's a lot. Um, it's the most common of all endocrine diseases. Um, and according to the PCOS Foundation, less than half of all women with PCOS are actually getting diagnosed correctly, meaning that millions more could be potentially unaware of their condition. Um, and that's also a result of many women going without diagnosis until they're trying to conceive in their 20s and 30s. Um, and it doesn't work, and they're trying to conceive for a while, go to the doctors, boom, turns out I have PCOS. The real numbers could be closer to 20%, so it's a lot. Um, and then according to the CDC, uh, it's the most common cause of infertility, which leads me to my next myth, that you can't get pregnant with PCOS. Uh, the fact is, women with PCOS often talk about how the fear of infertility causes long-lasting psychological distress, 
They feel pressure to conceive early. They have difficult conversations with their partners. They find themselves um, trying to conceive unsuccessfully for years. And some even alter their parenthood goals. That's the boat that I found myself falling into um, a few years ago before the medical community started producing a lot more research on the subject. We do now know that although it's a barrier to pregnancy with the right treatment plan, um, regular ovulation and fertility can be restored. So that brings me to my next myth, final myth here. If you lose weight, you can get rid of your PCOS. It's true that many women who have PCOS resistance and inflammation that are driving it. PCOS does not discriminate and it can affect women of all shapes and sizes. Correlation does not equal causation here. About 25% of women with PCOS are not in bigger bodies and 75% of that group still has insulin resistance. So we have to remember there are people who develop deep diabetes in all shapes and sizes. So genetics plays a big role in what our predisposition is. To give another example, Abby has spoken in her webinars about the analogy of a smoker's cough and cigarettes um, trying to treat the cough or the symptom with medications, it doesn't change the root cause of the issue, which is the smoking. So only focusing on losing weight alone or the cough will not cure the root cause. It's important to look beyond symptoms. That's why when you're looking at developing a well-rounded treatment plan, lifestyle factors such as nutrition, movement, and stress reduction techniques are gonna help improve how your body uses insulin and to help regulate hormones. In essence, body size as a standalone factor does not mean that you will develop PCOS and losing weight as a standalone factor does not guarantee that you will get rid of your PCOS. Unfortunately, there's still a lot of poor guidance coming from the medical community. Doctors are commonly taught only to treat symptoms that's why it's very, very important to make sure that for those of us with PCOS or really any of us with complex health issues, we um, learn to educate ourselves, to advocate for ourselves and to find a specialist that has a lot of experience and success in treating patients with the, with the disorders that you're struggling with. <laughs> Continuing on with that point of self-education and self-advocacy. I would like to share my personal story. So I started to realize that there might be something wrong a couple years after hitting puberty. I had acne. My pediatrician would recommend that I stay active because I was uh, chubby and I was getting really bad cramps, which can be normal for those teenage years when your body's changing. Um, but I started to develop the abnormal hair growth on my stomach, on my neck, and on my face. At first, it was kind of chalked up to the fact that my dad is uh, kind of a bear of a man, so to speak, and that maybe I had inherited those genes from him. But as I got older and it got worse, and I also started to develop the irregular cycles and so forth, a couple other things, but it became apparent something else had to be going on. Um, now, when I was a kid, I was a total candy fiend. Um, and I look back knowing what I know now, and I'm just like, man, I had no idea the inflammatory damage that I was doing because of having this predisposition to insulin resistance and diabetes. Um, and as I got older, and more into sports, which in some ways was good for me. But unfortunately, I did become more compulsive about what at the time I believed to be health. Um, and I always felt like, man, um, I work out more than anyone else I know. I'm so regimented with my food and I still can't get my body to do hash hashtag body goals. You know, what's going on? Why is this happening? I used all of these face products and my acne wouldn't go away. Um, I was just constantly wondering like, why me, why is this happening? 
little did I know that this was um, the start to a pattern of disordered eating, but we'll touch on that later. Um, you know, the other things I would, I would blow up like a balloon and have a ton of fluid retention if I ate baked goods, it would make me feel so lethargic and horrible afterwards. And my brothers weren't experiencing that. My friends weren't experiencing that. You know, it just seemed really out of place and odd that I was having all these issues. Um, in addition, there was an event in high school where I had a cyst rupture. It was extremely painful. I actually thought I had an um, appendicitis for a couple days. But yeah, my mom ended up taking me to a doctor. We went to see the gynecologist and they did the ultrasound and found the cysts on my ovaries. So that coupled with the hirsutism, coupled with irregular periods, um, was enough for them to say I most likely had PCOS. Uh, overall though, there was hardly any information given to us. They put me on birth control. Um, that was just, that was it. Here's the pill. <laughs> and I trusted my doctors. I, I just sort of put it on the back burner and I had a lot of other stuff going on at the time. Um, I was dealing with a major ACL repair surgery and then trying to get ready to go off to college. Uh, so it wasn't until I was nearing my senior year of college when I decided to take a more active role in my own health care. So I, I just felt beaten down from the years of low self-esteem. I was essentially dealing with a five o'clock shadow that I felt I had to hide from the world to avoid judgment. Um, I didn't really date because I was too embarrassed. I didn't really like people getting very close to me because I was afraid they would see. And at that point, I had already spent thousands of dollars on laser hair removal and it just came back worse than ever. It wasn't working. Um, I was really on a mission to get answers and see what could be done to reverse the problem. Also, um, before we move on, I just want to note that the level to which I beat myself up with this was part of my disordered relationship with myself. I now realize that Body hair is a normal part of the human experience. Everyone is different. And when a woman struggles with hirsutism, there shouldn't be any shame around how she chooses to handle it or present herself to the world. But anyways, I, I went to see a different doctor. Um, they evaluated me, did some blood work, and they were able to see that I did have elevated uh, free testosterone. So I was put on a medication called spironolactone that um, binds with the excess androgens and helps eliminate it from the body. Um, I was told that it should help with my issues. It was also suggested that, that I get an IUD, that um, he could put me on metformin, which is an insulin sensitizing drug for diabetics. And, and I told him I didn't really feel like that was an option I was comfortable with because one, I didn't want to be dependent on a drug, but also I was already eating a diet that was keeping my blood sugar levels stable. And he basically told me, well, I can't help you then. <laughs> so after having made these adjustments for a year, I didn't see any results, started losing face. And that's when I really dived into my own research. It literally took me doing like super sleuthing online through research papers to finally learn that um, with hirsutism, once the hormones change that hair follicle from um, a fine baby hair to a dark hair, that hair follicle is gonna remain dark forever. And um, you know, even if hormone levels are restored, it, it doesn't matter. And so the only way to combat that is with um, a FDA approved method called electrolysis. That is not the same thing as laser hair removal. Anyways, um, when I found out that it was, you know, as simple as getting electrolysis, but also that things weren't going to really change unless I got that um, done, I got really frustrated. I was like excited, but frustrated. Why, why hadn't anybody ever been able to tell me this? Why weren't doctors giving me this, this really valuable information? So I started uh, researching electrolysis centers all around the world. The best one is actually here in Atlanta, um, Michelle's Electrolysis Center, shout out. Um, they have people fly from all over the country. I was determined, so I started driving monthly from Chattanooga to Atlanta. 
and uh, my results have taken about a year and a half, but they've been totally amazing for me. Um, and all of this started to get me thinking, okay, if I was able to solve this symptom while researching on my own, what other symptoms could I remedy through more research and, and looking at alternative ways just besides pharmaceuticals? Um, just this past year, one of my pastimes has been reading and listening to as much PCOS expert material as I can get my hands on, a lot of podcasts, some books. Um, I have decided that my next goal is going to be to see if I can get myself naturally ovulating um, and therefore have proof that I would be able to have children. Because before, I just didn't think that that was going to be an option for me. Uh, I did get my IUD removed and have been looking into some different supplements and herbs that would get my brain talking to my ovaries. Um, obviously, if you have the money for it, dec definitely recommend working with a registered dietitian, naturopath, um, reproductive endocrinologist, something like that, a PCOS specialist. Um, if I can't get myself ovulating on my own, my next step is going to be to work with a professional. So the next thing that I want to talk about is some treatment options. Um, As I've mentioned, there is no, uh, it's very important that whenever you walk into your doctor's office for any reason, you walk in owning your body literacy. Um, with potential PCOS patients, the doctor's likely going to have a discussion about medical history, um, including um, menstrual cycles and weight changes. Do not beat yourself up for this. A physical exam will include checking for signs and symptoms. Um, and the doctor might do a pelvic exam, some blood tests, or possibly an ultrasound. Once a diagnosis has been given and the type determined, there's going to be several options for treatment. Um, the treatment's going to be focused on managing the individual's concerns. At least it should be. That's why you need to advocate for yourself. So are you trying to get pregnant or are you trying to avoid pregnancy? Do you have excess hair growth or acne that you're trying to get rid of? Are there any other health issues that you personally would like addressed? Um, and treatment can be with standard pharmaceuticals. Like I've said, the birth control pill is common, clomiphene, metformin, spironolactone, and some others. Um, there's definitely pros and cons to the standard medication regimen. So it's important to discuss all the potential complications with your doctor. Sometimes these are more um, Band-Aid approaches that uh, you will not be able to come off of without relapse and mood problems. And it can also cause a threefold risk in lethal blood clots, for example. That being said, pharmaceuticals can still be useful as an immediate tool to alleviate certain symptoms. So then we've got integrative and naturopathic options. Those are gonna be with herbs and supplements such as berberine, myonositol and decaronositol, uh, glutathione, um, N-acetylcysteine, turmeric, adaptogens, et cetera. You can see those there. Um, and then if you work with a registered dietitian, they will look at macronutrient profiles to see if there are any deficiencies. Many people don't know this, but minerals are the precursors to hormones. Oftentimes women with PCOS us are chronically low in selenium, zinc, magnesium, a couple of vitamins, um, iron. Also, it's good to get them on a high quality fish oil supplement. Uh, the, red, the, the RD may recommend um, a low insulin or low glycemic diet, possibly an anti-inflammatory diet, or possibly a prenatal diet, depending on what your type and goals are. So um, lifestyle modifications are going to um, be recommended with any of the treatment routes. Uh, stress reduction methods such as better sleep hygiene, meditation, yoga, um, different types of self-care, those are all gonna be super helpful. The benefits of exercise and especially strength training are primi uh, primarily related to um, improving insulin resistance, as well as of course, you know we know mood and self-confidence. It's important and helpful um, for insulin resistance as well, because the more stored energy that the muscle cells are gonna use up, the more room there is for those sugars to be pushed in like we talked about. 
Um, and the bigger that the muscle gets, the more energy it will require overall. Important to note here is a common misconception that bigger muscles raise androgen levels. Ladies, this is not true. Ovary problems cause increased androgens. So do not be afraid to get in the gym and lift. Exercise can be a double-edged sword, however, and more does not equal better when you already have issues in a delicate system. Exercise does cause some acute inflammation and high intensity training could cause even more inflammation on top of what is already there. So self-awareness and intuitive training can be pretty key when it comes to not overdoing it or causing more stress on the body. Now, I want to point out that uh, more than just being a gym and helping people with their physical fitness, Clarity is dedicated to helping people to create balance, develop self-love, and encourage community members to be active participants in their own healing. I do feel very grateful to be a part of something that I resonate with so much. Uh, I didn't really dive too deep into the psychological aspects in my earlier testimony, but having PCOS has definitely caused me to struggle with disordered eating, uh, depression, and anxiety. As this slide highlights, there we go. <laughs> um, I did a lot of fitness challenges and yo-yo dieting, and I was obsessed with trying to reach a certain body type, as you can see circled in pink. <laughs> um, it was not gonna be sustainable for me. I was never diagnosed because I couldn't afford to see a therapist, but I knew that my behaviors were indi indicative of um, binge eating disorder, and then even more like in college of orthorexia. Orthorexia is um, a pattern of fear-based restrictive eating where you are obsessed with eating only healthy foods, healthy foods, right? Uh, I would compulsively check ingredients lists. I would think about what I was going to eat next all day. Um, I would try track every bite of food and restrict my calories. It was, it was really excessive um, obsession with this. And I look back and I have, I do have a lot of compassion for myself because I know that it was my insecurities with my body and the, and the PCOS symptoms that caused me to feel very, very unfeminine. And those were drivers for the behaviors. I just recently started working with a therapist and I have been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, I'm very relieved and proud of myself for doing the hard work that has taken to start shifting the mindset. And I'm happy to report that as of right now, I eat a version of the anti-inflammatory diet that works for me. And I make sure to be conscious about keeping my blood sugars level and I don't stress or get down on myself when I make the choice to be flexible with foods. I don't punish my body with exercise. I move when I want to, and I do what feels good. I still struggle with body image issues, but overall I feel a lot more at peace. There we go. <laughs> Um, intuitively, it makes sense that eating disorders and mental health issues would arise out of condition like PCOS and the literature is starting to come out um, is suggesting that this is true. About 60% of women with PCOS have some sort of mood disorder. Depression in women um, has a pretty high range as you can see here up to 64%, anxiety up to 57%. And specifically, a study done by um, Columbia University School of Nursing. Um, they looked at PCOS complications that might be most responsible for mental health issues. And you know, they, what they realized was that although symptoms can be distressing, it was actually the irregular menstrual cycles that was the strongest predictor for mental health issues. And uh, that could be tied to the fact throw off your, your system, including your mental health. Um, most of the research has focused on depression and anxiety, but there were a few studies that said that there was an increased risk of the OCD, um, bipolar, and eating disorders. Um, research on eating disorders with PCOS is uh, it's limited. The uh, prevalence does seem to be, though, a bit higher 
in PCOS populations than normal populations um, with like about a 21% to a 4% difference. Um, but several clinicians that I was personally reading about have reported that nearly 100% of their patients have mental health um, issues and eating disorder patterns. So I want to emphasize that even if this isn't a disorder that affects you personally, the likelihood that you know someone who struggles with PCOS is one in 10 and possibly one in every five women you know. Several well-known celebrities that have spoken out about their diagnosis, excuse me, and symptoms are Lee Michelle from Glee, um, uh, Sasha or A from Pretty Little Liars, Jillian Michaels, everyone knows her. She actually struggled with infertility. Um, and then Daisy Ridley from Star Wars has spoken out about her acne. Um, Victoria Beckham had infertility issues. And then just recently, Kiki Palmer came out with her story and struggle with cystic, ac cystic acne caused by PCOS. It's nice to know that their celebrities are just like guys, right? Um, so probably one of the most well-known PCOS advocates is British anti-bullying activist, life coach, motivational speaker, model, and Guinness Book Record holder, Parnam Kar. She has upheld a commitment to letting her hair grow out in accordance with religious beliefs um, and has been hailed as a body positive heroine. As a teen, Parnam became so self-conscious that she refused to leave her house. Um, at her lowest point, she began self-harming and even considered taking her own life. Um, in her words here, my message to other women suffering from the same condition would be, do not suffer in silence. Always speak up about it and talk to your doctor about how to treat your symptoms. The thing with PCOS is that it also affects women emotionally. And again, it's important to talk about your feelings. If you're being body shamed, then do not take it. You need to find self-love. You need to change your thought process and you will flourish both internally and externally. I absolutely agree with this. In whichever form or fashion an individual decides to address their symptoms, there shouldn't be any shame surrounding them. Advocacy work involves sharing things about yourself that many people find uncomfortable hearing, but doing so with the intent to create change. It's sacrificing your privacy and being vulnerable for the greater good. What can you do as a family member or friend? Families, friends, um, and other supporters can help the most by validating the experiences, um, validating that there is a big burden of, burden of coping and trying to manage the symptoms. So listening and reflecting back to, um, listening and reflecting their experience back to them, it's a powerful tool that these women um, will help them feel heard and understood. So encourage your loved ones also um, just to keep on top of their, um, their mental health care, their medical care, and to proactively practice their own self-care and self-love. If you are interested in learning more about PCOS, how to be an advocate, or even looking for support groups, I have linked resources on this page here. I do wanna to touch on um, World PCOS Day is on September 1st and kicks off the whole month of September. The color is teal. And there is a link to sign a petition as well as a ton of support groups listed here. The biggest thing that you can do to be an advocate is to talk to your friends about this webinar, share and post, and to help increase awareness, especially if you may know someone who's struggling with these signs and symptoms. I wanna thank you guys so much for joining today and I hope everyone has enjoyed this presentation. Ideally, it was educational and you can say you learned something new. Uh, if you resonated with the vulnerability that I brought forward and you have been inspired to start down a path of healing and self-acceptance, please leave us a comment down below this video and open up the dialogue. Blessings, everyone.